Okay, hi, we're gonna talk about diabetes. The big question with diabetes is what causes diabetes? And hardly anybody knows this. Diabetes is caused by eating saturated fat and by drinking excessive amounts of processed fructose. That's key. If you only remember one thing from this talk, that's the most important thing to get out of this. Diabetes is a lipid disease. Everyone says, oh, it's a carbohydrate disease. No, it is primarily a lipid disease. Hyperglycemia is a secondary effect of ingesting large amounts of lipid. That's an important point. If you ever want to cure a disease, you have to remove what causes the disease. And in order to remove what causes or avoid what causes a disease, you have to know what causes a disease. And what causes diabetes is eating excessive amounts of saturated fat. That's the key thing, okay? So what causes diabetes? Eating excessive amounts of saturated fat or drinking excessive amounts of fructose. When I say drinking excessive amount of fructose, I just mean that the fastest way to bolus yourself with fructose is drinking a whole bunch of like soda pop or one of these other sweetened drinks, energy drinks, any one of those things. Here is the best paper ever written on diabetes in the entire history of diabetes. It's the Banting Lecture of 2004. The author is named Michael Brownlee. Michael Brownlee is a type one diabetic, okay? And the guy's a genius, he deserves a Nobel Prize. Okay, next, intramyocellular lipid. So what's thought to happen is when you eat large amounts of saturated fat, the saturated fat is able to get inside the skeletal muscle cell more quickly and more thoroughly than does the glucose. Typically when you eat a meal, ideally postprandially, 80%, maybe even 85% of that glucose should go and be stored in the muscle, largely in the form of glycogen for the muscle. The muscles are all over the body, they're pretty big. So they can store a lot of glycogen. Your liver can store you know, a good reasonable amount to maintain your blood sugar for the course of one day, but you can store quite a lot of uh, postprandial glucose in your skeletal muscle, and that's a good spot for it. That's where glucose should be stored. Um, it's glycogen in the liver and in the muscles primarily. All right, so anyways, what else we're gonna talk about? Saturated fat, we'll go into the mechanism in just a moment, but just so you know, it is specifically, especially saturated fat, more so than other types of fat. Um, intramyocellular lipid, this is the way it's often described, let's say in research papers and studies, the accumulation of fat within the skeletal muscle cells. Intra, within the skeletal muscle, myo, meaning muscle, cellular, intracellular, lipid. It is the fat inside the skeletal muscle cells themselves that cause the cell to almost sense overnutrition, and that overnutrition then sends a message through protein kinase C to the cell membrane to not send glucose type four transporters to the plasma cell membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. And therefore the insulin, the glucose can't get in. And so it gets trapped in the blood and you get blood elevated glucose, hyperglycemia. We're gonna to come to a diagram of that in just in a moment, but just to introduce you to it. And you'll see this in the paper. Shulman's paper in particular is pretty good and there's other ones on the subject. They've, they've, they've got nuclear magnetic resonance techniques whereby they can show there's increased lipid in the skeletal muscle in diabetic patients, okay? Um, it's also been shown most people who are overweight have problems with their insulin sensitivity. Okay, so here's this concept of overnutrition. When the skeletal muscle has so much calories in the form of metabolic work, it senses what has been described as overnutrition. And the fat gets in that skeletal muscle in larger amounts and faster such that it then is sending a message through protein kinase C, diacylglycerols that we don't wanna take any more glucose at this point. We're sort of overwhelmed with the metabolic job that we have to do. Um, the saturated fat is gonna actually cause reversal of electron transport. You know the three steps in metabolism, typically, typically let's say for glucose. You got glycolysis, then you got Krebs cycle, also called tricarboxylic acid cycle, and then electron transport. Well, this excessive amounts of saturated fat are gonna interrupt electron transport. It's actually gonna cause reversal of electron transport. And once electron transport reverses, Krebs cycle gets backed up. It's like having a, the roads blocked on a highway. All the traffic backs up. And it's gonna back up into glycolysis, and then from glycolysis, you know, coming off your three carbon molecules, like three phosphoglyceraldehyde, you're gonna have production of methylglyoxal, which then tends to form those advanced glycation end products, okay? But, so that's the overview, and that's the key thing. Diabetes is a lipid disease. A couple more things on papers. Sweeney's paper back in 1927 called Dietary Factors That Influence Dextrose Tolerance Test. The point of that was you could feed a high fat meal to a bunch of young people, you know, college age, medical student age, and they'll de start developing insulin resistance. That's been shown, you know, close to 100 years ago, okay? Nowadays, too, a lot of people have these continuous glucose monitors, so they can tell what makes their blood glucose level go up. And you'll see that when they eat a high fat meal, a couple hours later, the blood glucose goes up, person gets a lack of sleep, 
increase cortisol, their glucose is going to go up. Caffeine is going to sort of mimic the acute stress response, glucose is going to go up. High glycemic carbohydrate meal, glucose is going to go up. Uh, one thing too is look at epidemiology. You're going to say, oh, well, what's another supporting evidence that diabetes is primarily lipid disease? Who gets diabetes? People who eat a lot of fat. You don't see much diabetes in these populations, these old hunter-gatherer populations, these old rice-eating populations that eat tons of carbohydrates. Take a look at the rural populations in China, for example, when they used to eat tons of rice. Um, they have hardly any diabetes. Look at the Okinawans who eat tons of carbohydrate, primarily in the form of uh, sweet potatoes. Let's say 75% sweet potatoes. Hardly any diabetes, okay? It's the persons who eat a lot of fat, eat a lot of meat, drink a lot of fructose, liquid fructose, is like drinking liquid fat to a large extent. They get a lot of diabetes and they get fat. Fat people tend to get a lot more diabetes, okay? Compare from epidemiology. Look at the Pima population in Arizona, okay? Mexican-American War, 1848. You separate the Pima population into Arizona and you got the Tarahumara who stayed in Northern Mexico. Tarahumara eating their old fashioned diet, uh, beans and whatnot, and a lot of starches. They're skinny ultra marathon runners. Okay, they don't have hardly any diabetes. Then you look at the Pima. The Pima, they're eating sort of the standard American diet, a lot of meat and fat, and they got lots of obesity and diabetes. Okay, what's so unique about saturated fat? Saturated fat undergoes beta oxidation. It's a way to metabolize the fat, catabolism of the fat. And the saturated fat, one of the early steps in beta oxidation, it's called beta oxidation because you oxidize the beta carbon. If you look at a fatty acid, you're gonna have couple carbons here. You're going to have the carboxylic acid carbon right here, then you're going to have the alpha carbon, and then you're going to have the beta carbon, okay? And this beta carbon is going to go from uh, just having hydrogens on it to having a ketone on it. So that's the beta carbon oxidation. Then you're going to split it right through here and take off, right through here you're going to split it and take off this two carbon unit. Um, and that's, that's how, like an acetyl-CoA unit, that can go into the tricarbo tricarboxylic acid cycle. So, but the point is, one of the first steps of beta oxidation is to produce a double bond. And during that production of a double bond, you're going to make an FADH2. FADH2 is just an electron carrier. It's a way to carry energy to the electron transport chain. Okay, it actually goes to coenzyme Q of the intermitochondrial membrane, the FADH2 from beta oxidation of saturated fat. And the point is, let's say you had a PUFA. A PUFA is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. It already has a double bond. You don't need to make a double bond, and therefore you don't get this FADH2 production. And this extra FADH2 that is produced for saturated fat, but not for PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, contributes to saturated fat having more of an effect towards overwhelming the electron transport chain with these electrons from this electron carrier. Okay, and that's going to make the voltage gradient go too high on the intermitochondrial membrane. And when the intermitochondrial membrane voltage gradient goes too high, electron transport starts to shut down in reverse. Um, and this reversal of electron transport is again like the highways block setting in action a backup of all of Krebs cycle and of glycolysis. Okay, so this is a diagram of the intermitochondrial matrix. Uh, well, here's the intermitochondrial matrix inside. Here is the intermitochondrial membrane. This right here is the intramembranous space. And then there'll be an outer mitochondrial membrane. Let's just say this top piece of paper here is the outer mitochondrial membrane. So within the intramembranous space, these complexes, complex one, complex three, complex four, they pump protons in here to build up a proton gradient. You can imagine it like a pressurized air system almost. If you're pumping pressurized air into something, then when you let it out, like let's say uh, you have a pressurized air source, let's just say you then have energy generated. It'll come out under pressure, and that's utilized by complex five to make an ATP. This is called the Mitchell's hypothesis, the chemiosmotic hypothesis, and it's the mechanism of electron transport, and then this is called oxidative phosphorylation. This is called electron transport because the electrons are transported through a series of carriers which progressively have more and more electron affinity, electronegativity, want to grab those electrons. And the most powerful electron acceptor is oxygen. It has a very high electronegativity. It's right up there next to the halogens, okay? So oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor that then gets converted into water, H2O. So they running down this gradient, the electrons are passed. And then what's done is, at each step, some of that energy is harvested as it goes from one electron uh, holder to the next, and those are used to pump the protons out. If you just 
try to take all the energy out of metabolizing glucose all at once. You'd, like, you'd have a mini fire and you wouldn't have much useful energy. By sort of taking the energy from glucose in these small steps, these are almost like little batteries, these electron carriers, like FADH2, dropping off a couple of electrons to the electron transport chain. And then it's coupled to oxidative, because oxygen's involved, phosphorylation, and that's where now an, a, a, one of these protons comes back through, and now that energy is used to add a phosphate onto ATP. And ATP is sort of like money for a cell. The reason why ATP is like money, that means adenosine triphosphate. If you ever look at a phosphate, you got a phosphorus surrounded by a couple of oxygens with negative charges. They make, they have a strong electro repulsion to the rest of the molecule. So that phosphate wants to jump off. And so the ATP can really facilitate a lot of reactions because this is a very high energy phosphate that wants to get away from the other negative charges. And when it's taken off, that energy created by that will help a lot of uh, reactions to run. Okay, so this was the top part of the drawing, just showing you how electron transport normally works. What happens though with beta oxidation, you keep on sending so much FADH2 to coenzyme Q, and remember there's electrons coming in from other areas to this electron transport chain. It gets overwhelmed. It'll stop, the gradient gets too high, and it'll start to go backwards, okay? Normally, when insulin binds, now we're on a different topic, so let's just look at everything below here. This is now the outer plasma cell membrane of the cell. Normally, insulin in the blood will bind to the cell, and the insulin will activate through its receptor these glucose 4 transporters, they're called GLUT4s, to then be sent up to the plasma cell membrane, and this protein will be integrated into the plasma cell membrane, and through this protein, Normally, it then will form a channel through which glucose can come into the cell. Okay? That's how it normally is supposed to work. Insulin is sending a message to the skeletal muscle. Glucose is now available. Take this up, make it into glycogen. And what's happening, though, when this is all backed up, there's a series of steps that lead to GLUT4 being blocked from going up to the plasma cell membrane. When GLUT4 is blocked from going up to the plasma cell membrane, then glucose will start to... Uh, increase its concentration in the blood because it can't get into the skeletal muscle cell. And when, the thing that's leading to this whole process is that ex excessive amounts of saturated fat that have gotten into the skeletal muscle cell overwhelm coenzyme Q, I'm sorry, overwhelm coenzyme Q right here, and then this causing the backup. All right. So when you can't get the glucose into the cell and you now have hyperglycemia in the blood, that causes a new problem. The hyperglycemia cannot get into skeletal muscle because it's insulin dependent for its glucose type 4 transporters. But there are other cells in the body that are not insulin dependent for uptake of glucose. And that would include in the eyes, okay, the retina. That's why you get diabetic retinopathy. That would include in the kidney. That's why you get diabetic nephropathy. In some of the peripheral nerves, that's why you get diabetic neuropathy and also in the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells line your arteries, and that's why you get diabetic um, microvascular arteriopathy. So um, that's pretty much the overview of what happens with diabetes. And like we said, the key thing to be aware of is, is that excessive fat intake, and that's been shown in a bunch of papers, fructose being also able to do it. Why does fructose do it? When fructose comes into the cell, let's say, you got, you're in the liver here. I'll make a, here's a liver, okay. If you got glucose coming in, glucose will come into a cell. I know it looks like a whole liver, but glucose will get phosphorylated. So let's say we go to glucose 6-phosphate, all right? But fructose, when it comes in, it gets metabolized through a couple of steps, and it doesn't enter glycolysis until you get to the 3-carbon phase, where you got DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde, okay? And then also up in here, you're going to have PFK, fossil fructokinase. All right, so what's the point? The point is that fructose enters glycolysis after the main regulatory step, like PFK, which is largely ATP de dependent. It measures the energy level of the cell. So by fructose coming in as a big bolus, it can kind of overwhelm the individual liver cell. And this excessive amount tends to get made into fat. And that's why drinking large amounts of fructose is almost like drinking fat. And to explain that a little better, they're both six carbon sugars, glucose and fructose. Typically, you know, evolutionarily, when you eat a fruit, let's say you eat an apple or orange, there's about four grams of fructose in there, and it comes packaged with some fiber and some vitamin C, which help to make it a healthy thing. However, when fructose is drinking, let's say a can of soda pop, you could have 50 grams of fructose in there, 
and it can very quickly come and overwhelm these cells because it's such a large bolus, there's, it's in a liquid, there's no fiber, it's very rapidly absorbed, there's virtually no vitamin C in it and it'll get processed and the, the net result of this it'll be made into fat and that's it also creates increased uric acid. We'll talk, fructose is a big subject and we'll talk about that more in a later lecture but just be aware the net result of it will be increased lipid and increased uric acid and both of those things cause a significant amount of problems. That's why I would, I never drink any sweetened drink of any type whatsoever. Um, I also, then now the question too, what are people are wondering? Well, what can you do? Now you got this information, what's useful out of it? This is why I recommend for, for all people, including for diet, type 2 diabetics, eat a 100% plant-based, whole food, low fat, low salt diet. And um, that will tend to optimize your blood glucose and prevent diabetes. The reason is, when you eat a high fiber food like a starch, uh, let's say your oatmeal, quinoa, um, beans are great, uh, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, your gut first of all, your stomach gets stretched because it's a low caloric density. That distension of your stomach provides early satisfaction of hunger, early satiety. Then as it passes into your small bowel, your small intestine has to peel that fiber off before the glucose can be absorbed into the blood. That takes time, so it has a net effect of being like a slow energy release pill. Here, I can draw that too. Okay, so let's just make this about 100, okay? So normal blood glucose is sort of in this range, 90 to 100, let's say. When you eat the starch, you're gonna get a slow increase in your blood glucose. It comes up very gradually, stays normal for a long amount of time. You feel good, you're in the zone, you're, you're, you're happy, all right? On the other hand, if you, if you drink a liquid sugar, let's say it's a glucose, and so now we're gonna be talking about glucose. Fructose is sort of a separate subject. You spike your glucose fast, the pancreas will overcompensate, release too much insulin, sugar will come down fast, and when you get this rapid, it's called rebound hypoglycemia. And when that happens, your pancreas isn't really designed for that. It'll tend to overcompensate and secrete too much insulin such that it drives your blood glucose down kind of rapidly. And you get this lousy rebound, it's called rebound hypoglycemia effect. And because you feel lousy, you'll, and it comes on kind of suddenly, you'll often grab a cup of coffee, or cookies and donuts, and that'll tend to cause your blood glucose to spike again. And so a lot of fat people end up with this roller coaster blood glucose curve, this red line here. Uh, from eating too many sweets. Problem with the meats is all the fat. Your body wants to store fat rather than burn it. Lipid is the body's way to store energy for the long term. Glycogen is short brief storage to maintain blood glucose overnight, for example. But long term storage, you don't have to store, you store glycogen, glucose with water, okay? You can store fat pretty dry, so you can store a tremendous amount of calories in the form of fat, as we all know. Okay, uh, so, and also it's high caloric density meats and oils, super high caloric density, so you can, need thousands of calories to stretch your stomach and it doesn't satisfy hunger as well. Eating a lot of meat and oils and fats, it makes you get fat. It, it predisposes towards obesity. But anyways, this is just, you know, lecture part one of diabetes. We'll have more talks about diabetes in the future and the key thing that we learn from this is it's primarily a lipid disease caused by eating lipids and if you want to avoid getting the type 2 diabetes, then don't be eating lipids and don't be drinking all this, these sweetened drinks. Those are the two main things that predispose people to get diabetes. Type 2.